Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the next conversation about Russia and Ukraine. Um, one of the things I wanted to say before we start this uh, conversation is that um, one of the things that makes New America so particularly unique um, among think tanks and policy institutes is our relationship with media. Um, the people who work for us and our fellows write for large popular audiences. I think even if you look at people like our board member, Atul Gawande, taking really complicated ideas and, and communicating them in ways that are accessible and open up discourse that, that otherwise wouldn't be possible. Um, Beyond, uh, beyond the writing that our staff and fellows do, that we have great relationships with media. We're, we're a trusted source of ideas and policy and research and analysis. And as I go through introducing each of the uh, panelists who can come up here while I'm talking, Susan and Peter and Ramesh, um, I want to say a little bit about that. I I'm going to start with Ramesh. Um, Ramesh was a fellow at New America. I guess he's still a future tense fellow. Um, he's currently at, at a deputy editor at Bloomberg Business Week. Uh, Ramesh played a really key role back when he was at Time Magazine in helping us with another 10 Big Ideas event, and that was a, a, a New America um, actually put together a set of 10 ideas for Time Magazine a couple of years ago, and um, it, obviously it had the kind of impact that you would want out of something like that. Susan Glasser is like a member of our family. Uh, Susan, uh, Foreign Policy Magazine, where she was editor, um, uh, lived with us for a while. We had space on our fifth floor, and um, they, they cohabitated with us. and. Uh, Together with foreign policy in our space, we were able to um, craft something very exciting that has been longstanding, which is the AFPAC channel, which is um, a really powerful daily um, roundup of news um, and blog um, about the region and um, had an incredible following. Susan is the editor at Politico now. Peter, I don't really know what to say. Uh, you're the White House correspondent at the New York Times, and I'm not sure you're really doing anything for us right now. But um, <laughs> we're going to count I'm on this here. being the beginning of a very long-standing relationship uh, uh, with the New York Times. But the real purpose, so the, the way this came about, um, I was with Susan not too long ago at a um, at a, uh, a, a different kind of conference, the North American Think Tank Summit. Um, and Susan mentioned, and I had forgotten, that um, she and Peter were co-authors of Kremlin Rising, Vladimir Putin's Russia and the end of the revolution. And um, we so much wanted to have a conversation about that on the stage, and, and we're delighted to have them here today. We don't get a lot of husband-wife teams on the stage either. So um, please welcome them and enjoy the conversation. Uh, well, thank you for uh, that introduction, Rachel. And uh, it's a great privilege for me to be here uh, and sharing the stage with these uh, two distinguished journalists who uh, know as much as anyone about both Washington uh, and the Kremlin, and in Peter's case, as we learned yesterday, he works for one. Uh, <laughs> now, uh, but I do want to start with Susan, um, and I'll give you the easy question. What is Putin thinking? I mean, what uh, do we know right now about sort of where, what his calculations are? I mean, it does seem as if in the last week's 10 days, he's at least rhetorically backed away a little bit. Um, he hasn't embraced these separatists and the, the results of the referendum. He's pulled his forces back. It, do you think he's looking for an off-ramp here, or is this a kind of tactical feint? Does he have something else up his sleeve? Well, thanks for starting with the easy question. <laughs> I, I appreciate that. Uh, so let me you know, dispense thanks with that starting with her. <laughs> <laughs> First of all, thank you to, to Rachel and to, to Anne Marie. I really, I, New America is is like home, and uh, you know I'll, I'll be talking with you later about how to move my new magazine uh, <laughs> back to New America. Um, I do think it's appropriate to start a conversation about the crisis that we're having with with Russia and Ukraine today uh, by talking about what Vladimir Putin is thinking, because in many ways, I think this has been a crisis that's been very much about one man and. Uh, Kremlinology, in many ways, has come down to Putinology, uh, in effect, over the last few years. And, and this is a really striking example of that. And so to the extent it seems opaque, or if you, if you read a lot of the play-by-play -play commentary each day, really, what are we having? We're having a debate about uh, what is Putin thinking? Has Putin changed or not? Is he crazy or not? Uh, is he a uh, sort of rational, calculating uh, steward of Russia's interests? Uh, has he become uh, a different kind of nationalist than he was before? Did we read him wrong? You know, basically, it's just 15 million different iterations of what is Vladimir Putin thinking. Uh, my own view is that uh, you can learn a lot by actually paying attention to what Vladimir Putin has said over time, and that 
uh, it, it would be a mistake to think that this marks a radical break in his thinking or some new personality that suddenly emerged. Uh, but in fact, you know, Putin was always uh, an aggressive, muscular nationalist. He came to power uh, through the waging of a war in, in late 1999. Inside Russia's own borders, he is willing to level cities and use extreme tactics. So why, of course, would he not be willing to do that outside of Russia's borders? Uh, you know, he has increased his ability to move and to have leverage and to obtain some of the goals uh, that he wants to obtain over the last decade because Russia is in a very different place economically, financially, and in other ways than it was before. Uh, so I think if you were seeing a more muscular and assertive Putin on the world stage, that reflects Russia's change in position much more than it reflects Putin's change in position, first of all. Second of all, there was a surprise here. I mean, I want to be clear on that. Uh, you know, although it had been talked about for years and certainly was a, a scenario that anyone inside the U.S. government uh, for the last two decades was, was more than familiar with, uh, you know, the, the gripe about the loss of Crimea uh, has been a longstanding Russian complaint. So, uh, you know, the complaint about Crimea wasn't a surprise. The actual move against it clearly was. Uh, uh, in, in every possible way. But what I'm struck by is actually how predictable events have moved since then. Putin correctly, it seems to me, read uh, the relatively muted nature of the response that that action would receive by the United States and, and by European partners. Uh, I think Putin uh, you know, correctly viewed that if he was able to then change the subject to would he or wouldn't he uh, invade eastern Ukraine, as we're now still discussing, uh, that in effect, he would get people to accept his takeover of Crimea, which it seems to me more or less we've done. You know, if you notice, that's the conversation that we're having is about will he go any farther, not what should we do about the territory that he's already taken. So uh, I'll leave it at that uh, just to start off with. But um, you know, it seems to me that uh, there's not been a lot of surprise or inconsistency in Putin's remarks, uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean we understand him. What, in your view, is an outcome that he would deem acceptable now in, in Ukraine. I mean, if, if we're assuming that essentially he's an ex-Crimea, that that's kind of that's kind of a fait accompli. Um, is the goal basically a return, his view, to uh, the situation before the ouster of Yanukovych, where he basically has a, a more or less, you know, a compliant uh, government in Kiev? I mean, it, or could he live with a government that is? has some of the opposition figures in it and that has continues to have a relationship with the West um, that's maybe a little closer than, than the previous government. I mean, wh where does he kind of see this all ending up in, in Russia's view? What, what's the optimal outcome in, in Ukraine? Well, that one's for Peter, right? <laughs> <laughs> You're doing so well. <laughs> I'll you look backwards. Yeah, you, you, can, well, you, you look in the crystal ball for it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah, <laughs> the problem for our hopes of a uh, Carvel Madeline like uh, TV show are going to be dis dispelled here because I think we largely agree. I think that um, I think that his hopes the, in the short term are to create an, a Ukraine that doesn't work, uh, you know, a dysfunctional state that cannot, in fact, get its act together. Which, quite honestly, might not have been able to get its act together even if Russia had absolutely nothing to do uh, with what's going on there, because in fact we saw that after the Orange Revolution. Uh, and, it, and as long as you have a dysfunctional state, there's no way the EU is going to want it. There's no way NATO is going to want it. And it becomes sort of a basket case in effect on his border. That's not, you know, optimal. Optimal would be, you know, they're his, they're his uh, subservient uh, uh, member of the Eurasian Union that he wants to form. But in the short term, I think, uh, given that that doesn't seem immediately likely, uh, he's trying to create a situation in which Ukraine, the new government in Ukraine, cannot succeed. Uh, and cannot, therefore, find a way to integrate with the West. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. And I think that it's also a way of being communicating as clearly as possible uh, that this is Russia's sphere of influence, that uh, uh, you know, to the extent we were ever contemplating uh, real NATO or EU expansion, uh, that the line has to be drawn here. And uh, you know, clearly, the Russians view their complaints about the expansion of NATO as having been unheard uh, over the last couple decades. And I think they believe they made a mistake in not more aggressively opposing uh, the expansion into the Baltics and, and other countries on the former Soviet periphery. And so I think this is really a strong statement about that as much as anything. Um, 
you know, does he need to, is he out to create a new Soviet Union? Uh, I don't necessarily think so. I think it's about uh, what he views as being in Russia's interests at this point. I mean, given how much support there seems to be, at least, I mean, it's hard to tell, obviously, from here, um, but it does seem as if that, you know, he's been able to kind of rally uh, his base and, and maybe even broaden it to some extent. Um, and there does seem to be a consensus in Russia, more or less, behind what he's done in Crimea. What, but does that become a kind of uh, something that you can't walk back from? I mean, once you've kind of raised these expectations, um, is it going to be harder for Russia to now essentially just kind of return to where it was before uh, they embarked on this adventure? Yeah. I mean, I think, look, you know, the great thing is if you're Vladimir Putin in the Kremlin, and you decide to retreat on some level, if you were to do that, a strategic retreat, a tactical retreat, um, domestically you'll be fine because you control TV stations and you control the way it's framed and you will be able to, to portray whatever decision you make in the most favorable light. So I, I don't think he has too much to worry about in that sense. And I think there's such a consternation in the power elite around him to the extent that they're nervous about it, they probably would find a lessening of tensions to be kind of a relief. So there's not gonna be like this backlash I don't think, from the hawk side uh, of, his, uh, of his circle, because uh, I don't think he's going to do anything that would be so drastically uh, peacenik suddenly that, that would offend them. Uh, and I think they recognize that there's a danger and there's a real cost to what they're doing, and they're, uh, they are trying to find a way to, to have both have their cake and eat it too. Well, I also do think, though, that it's, it's in many ways it is about shoring up Putin's position at home. Uh, you know, we, we tend to want to use the language of American politics when talking about, uh, you know, that's really not applicable when talking about the, the, the artificial and not real politics uh, in an authoritarian state like Russia. And I think that that's, uh, that's part of sometimes how we get fooled into thinking that they're going to do things that they don't end up doing. Because in reality, you know, they're, Putin controls the information space and has moved very aggressively uh, into the internet and to uh, uh, the remaining sort of, sort of uh, small spaces for free discourse in the society. Uh, his his popularity has been eroding over time up until this. The economy uh, is, is, is increasingly beleaguered and uh, in all of the period of his long tenure, uh, he's made few real moves uh, to do anything uh, other than continue to extract natural resources at as fast a clip as possible. They haven't modernized their oil and gas industry, so they're at, at severe risk uh, with the rise of, of fracking and unconventional uh, gas sources. Uh, you know, as the price of that erodes, they, they could be facing real instability uh, at home. And, and I think that that's where I took your question uh, to be. So this, this uh, tactic once unleashed uh, may prove to be addictive to Putin as he faces further troubles at home that he's uh, has increasingly few tools to deal with and you know gosh look at how your popularity spikes up even more uh, especially if you uh, are able to have a short and bloodless uh, war or takeover uh, of territory that you know makes you feel good about uh, what a big nationalist power you are in the world. And so in that sense, I could see them saying, well, maybe you know, next time we have a crisis, we should move on down the road uh, to Transdenistria and take that back uh, for Russia. You know, maybe there are other uh, techniques of this sort. Uh, maybe you know, there's always the Georgians to go after uh, again. Russia still is the predominant uh, military power in the region. And it, it, it does have the ability uh, to throw an increasingly uh, big swagger around in the neighborhood. So uh, I wouldn't rule that out at all. Well, let, let's turn to, to the White House and, and how they've handled um, this crisis, Peter. You know, obviously they've come under a fair amount of criticism on the Sunday talk shows and on the Hill for, for not doing enough, not being strong enough um, in standing up to Putin. Based on what people tell you, um, do, do folks at the White House feel as if uh, some of the steps they've taken, the sanctions that they've uh, imposed or threatened to impose have actually had some impact here in, in um, uh, changing the, the dynamics of the situation or, or do they feel that they've been uh, basically, they're, they're still being kind of outmaneuvered? Well, they would never uh, concede that they're being outmaneuvered. Um, I think that they feel like the sanctions have had um, 
some impact, and they make some arguments that that has contributed to this broader economic uh, problem that actually has preceded this particular crisis. I mean, Russia was in trouble economically before Yanukovych was pushed out, before the Russians went into Crimea. And in fact, that goes back to your point about you know revving up domestic support. Uh, you know, uh, they, they, they're they're already they're already in trouble in terms of the ruble. They're in trouble in terms of the markets, but they have also been punished by the markets since this has happened. The volatility has clearly scared away some foreign investment, clearly scared away uh, or scared people who are currently in Russia who are thinking about whether to expand or not. And the Obama administration would like to take credit for that and say that's because of the sanctions. You know, I think that plays into it, obviously. It's the fear of sanctions at the very least that is certainly preying on the minds of a lot of corporate compliance officers who are trying to figure out and scratch their heads saying, well, can we have a conversation with this person or can we not have a conversation with this person? Should our CEO go to St. Petersburg for the economic forum there or not? And this White House has more or less successfully stopped most American CEOs from going to St. Petersburg. Having said that, I think that there are people inside the administration who are frustrated with the administration's approach and think it hasn't been uh, robust enough, that even the things that they have do haven't been uh, applied in a way to extract the maximum pain without even necessarily escalation that uh, folks like Senator McCain, who I believe spoke here earlier, would, would favor. So um, there's a struggle inside the administration as to how much uh, uh, to make this the dominant uh, issue you have. On the one hand, Jack Lew, the Treasury Secretary, he looks around the world and says, hey, we're just getting this economy thing you know, in a more or less decent place here. Let's not screw it up. Right? So that's his perspective. Doesn't mean he doesn't want there to be tough action. He definitely does. I don't mean to mischaracterize him in any way. Uh, but, but he looks at the trade-offs that you have if you were yeah. to go to, say, sectoral sanctions. So there's a real debate going on. Well, I think I, I totally agree with that. And I, I think the reason there's a real debate going on is because there's an increasingly a recognition among the people we talk to who, who've been paying attention to Russia and really invested in a policy since the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1991 that more or less is now over. Uh, and so, you know, this is a major period of, of readjustment for these people uh, here in Washington trying to figure out about Russia. The goal of our policy ever since the collapse of the Soviet Union could be broadly defined as engagement. The idea was to basically enmesh Russia in the uh, sort of rules and obligations and the family of uh, Western institutions. Uh, integration wherever possible, uh, certainly engagement where it wasn't possible to have outright integration. And that was, you know, there was a whole fabric of things that went along with that. Um, it, that's now over. I think that there's a real sense, uh, not just in the Obama administration, uh, but in Europe as well, that that policy has not succeeded. Uh, that despite our big hopes uh, uh, at the end of the Cold War for our ability to overcome that legacy and to and to, to do what Europe was able to do, by the way, uh, with itself in Western Europe and to, to overcome those old hostilities, that that just hasn't proven to be doable uh, with Russia, at least as it's been reconstituted under Putin. So what's going to come next? And I think that's where, you know, when sanctions are a default uh, policy at this point, but they don't represent a new strategic vision of how to think about uh, Russia and Putin. They represent sort of something we can do right now while we're figuring that out. Well, I guess that, that is a question that, you know, I wonder if you, you guys can shed some light on. I mean, how much, how much when you think about the, all the issues that are in the kind of foreign policy inbox, you know, I, I don't, it didn't seem that, that this was probably, you know, priority number one before, you know, February. Yeah. Um, to what extent is it now kind of crowding out other priorities? I mean, how is the administration managing the Russia situation in the context of, you know, sort of other global challenges? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I think this is a challenge that Obama would just as soon not be dealing with. I think he finds this aggravating and frustrating because he, he, he doesn't want to be absorbed by this, doesn't want to spend his time on this. People who visit the White House uh, don't find him sitting there dwelling on it and talking about it in conversation. He'd rather talk about health care. He'd rather talk about all sorts of other issues, minimum wage and, 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 and so on. So the White House thinking about this is, can they prevent Putin from actually overtly sending in troops, overtly invading, and sort of push it off to make it basically what they expect to be a long-term irritant that needs to be managed 
but not something that's going to consume this presidency because they've got other things they'd rather do. And as you right. say, it does crowd out other things, even on the foreign policy thing, for getting the, the domestic agenda they've got. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think it's also, um, I think it's a good example, actually, of how uh, foreign policy not only is, is not really the front burner issue of this presidency, but uh, you know, events happen, uh, and they crowd out the best laid plans, and, and history really hasn't ended. I mean, I remember that we mocked Mitt Romney. Uh, we, right. we, we all mocked Mitt Romney in 2012 for saying that, you know, Russia remains the U.S.'s uh, uh, geopolitical enemy number one. Uh, and now you can still argue the point about whether you think that's the case or not, uh, but, you know, really, there, there. There, there weren't a lot of serious <laughs> foreign policy analysts uh, in, in, in the Democratic Party or in uh, the Obama White House who were saying that Russia was going to be uh, a major crisis of 2013 and 2014, and that has certainly proven to be the case. Um, I think there's probably a lot of people who want to ask questions of these two, so I'm happy to throw it open now if anyone has any questions. Yes. Just hold on, wait for the mic, here it comes. Thank you. Uh, two questions. One, one hears from uh, many Europeans that we are largely responsible for what has happened by putting a choke around Russia uh, with our NATO expansion, EU expansion, etc. Do you credit that? And uh, uh, the second is that while the Obama administration might be seen as a, a government that was elected to withdraw somewhat from foreign engagements, uh, at some point there will be triggers that will cause U.S. policy to turn around and feel too embarrassed. Senator McCain tried to say we're already at that point. Is this such a trigger mechanism that could change that general ethos of hmm. Obama's foreign policy? Yeah, on your, on your, your first question, I think that um, you know, that's a big debate, by the way, and, and, and it, it's one thing for Europe to blame the United States. They were part and parcel of the strategy. Uh, and in fact, you know, just as particularly in Eastern Europe, assertive in the idea that, that Europe should move east uh, following 1991. So if that's a mistake, it's certainly a joint mistake, not, not just a, an American one. Uh, but I think it's a deb debatable point. And that's, you know, did NATO expansion cause Russia to be revanchist or was Russia always going to be revanchist and therefore NATO expansion was a hedge against that? Uh, and I think you can make two good arguments there. There's no question, though, to understand Russia's point of view that you do need to understand this idea of encirclement. Fairly or not, that, you know, when we were there, you would see them have these maps, and they just had, you know, showed all the different places American troops were, as they viewed it, all around their border. And you can understand how that feeds into suspicion and paranoia and, 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 uh, and hostility, uh, even though, of course, we don't have uh, a policy intending to encircle them. We don't view them or didn't view them anyway uh, as the threat that they once were. Uh, but they look at the world through, the, through very uh, different uh, lenses than we do. And at the very least, we've got to have to understand how they look at the world. Do you want to talk a bit? Just one quick point about the current crisis, uh, which is to say it's very hard to blame the proximate events in Ukraine on the United States, considering that it was, uh, in fact, the EU uh, itself and its uh, failed accession talks with the Ukrainians, uh, which were responsible really for triggering uh, the protests in the Maidan that then spiraled into this revolution that toppled Yanukovych. Uh, in fact, uh, it's not even a question of the United States standing back and letting Europe take the lead. We, we're certainly not able to uh, take the lead in uh, talks to belong to a, a customs union of Europe that we, we ourselves are not members of. And I think there was a lot of bad feeling memorably summed up by Toria Newland's um, unfortunately leaked cell phone call uh, about the Europeans and whether they were to blame for this current crisis. I think there's one more question over here. Thank you very much. Hi, Afshin Malavi, uh, Bernard Schwartz Fellow alum. Uh, nice to see you, Susan. Nice to see you, Ramesh, um, and Peter, of course. Uh, Ramesh, um, uh, you mentioned foreign policy bandwidth. Well, obviously, foreign policy bandwidth 
when you talk about the Obama administration, uh, Iran is taking up a lot of foreign policy bandwidth. So I'd like to ask both Peter and Susan, uh, do you think that um, as a result of this conflict uh, between the Obama administration and Vladimir Putin, and understanding that Putinology is, 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 is an art, not a, not a science, but, but do, you, do you think that this is going to make it more complicated? Do you think this is, you know, Vladimir Putin is going to be less interested in working closely in, you know, with the United States and trying to secure a deal in the context of the P5 plus one? No, that's a great question. And, and in fact, it's very relevant this week, of course, as they all return to Vienna to try to you know, work out exactly such a deal. So far, what you hear from the Americans and the Europeans is that they, Russians have managed to compartmentalize this. It has not, you know, everyone's aware of the tension, obviously, and it certainly comes up from time to time in terms of, well, you really want our help. But the truth is what the people who are involved in negotiations say is the Russians have been constructive partners at this point uh, in those talks. Now, again, that could change. But that they, the, the, the rationale is that they have their own interests in making this happen and that they might see this as a way of keeping uh, membership in effect in the international community at a time when they've been kicked out of the G8 and they're being isolated in other ways so that this could in fact survive that tension. There are other ways we cooperate that haven't been uh, curtailed. We, you know, just the other day uh, they brought down five astronauts from the International Space Station. We didn't. We don't have the capacity to anymore, but two of them were American. So we haven't stopped that despite the tension and the, the same is true with uh, cooperative threat reduction and other programs. So. It is interesting to see that there has been sort of a compartmentalization on some things so far, but that might change if things really escalate. Okay, stop. We are done. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much.